So we started our uh, summer series in the Psalms a couple of weeks ago, and uh, one of the Psalms that we uh, looked at had the uh, happy sounds of, of Psalm 1. If you remember, I had my dead houseplant here that uh, we had managed to kill uh, as an example of something that's not thriving and that uh, leaves do not wither. But, you know, everybody loves a line that uh, says things like about a child of God. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and leaves whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Whatever they do prospers. Well, there are, are pleasant sounding promises like that in Psalm 1 that are definitely in our Bible. Um, but there are also others like Psalm 4. So, you know, a pro tip with the Bible uh, any passage that you focus on is keep reading because <laughs> there's usually a fuller understanding of, uh, of things um, than just isolating things by themselves. Uh, and so, you know, Psalm 4 is kind of like a, a reality check. It's a continuation of something we talked about last week that was about focus. You know, we've, we've talked about the Psalms um, as ways that uh, divided up in different ways to pray. And by the way, last Thursday night, we kind of broke out of our normal pattern, and we just had a time of prayer practicing those four things. You know, a prayer that's just, God, you're great, and the prayers of help, and the prayers of I trust you. You know, we prayed about things that just don't make sense to us right now, that we see happening in our own lives or in our world or in the lives of other people. And then finally, just prayers of thanksgiving. It was a meaningful time. We can use our psalms in that way. And we talked about the idea of... Uh, of a life's context. We talked about the perspective of life. Uh, we looked at a psalm that kind of gave us God's perspective on things. And then last week, we talked about the need to have the right focus. And, and this psalm we're going to look at today kind of continues on a little bit of that whole idea of a focus. And uh, a focus in the midst of a crisis. Because even though there are the beautiful promises like, like a tree planted by the water, Leaves never wither. We love hearing those kind of things. And then we run face on into life. And it can sometimes uh, knock us back pretty hard. And uh, so, you know, in the midst of a crisis, this psalm, Psalm 4, teaches us a lot about God. It teaches us a lot about ourselves. It teaches us about our enemies. It teaches us about our friends. And especially the confusing time when those last two categories get kind of blurred. You know, what do we do then? And, and like I say, if the context of the psalm that we looked at last week was David's um, experience of his son Absalom rebelling against him, that's a pretty safe conjecture because it said right at the top, this is about when uh, David's son Absalom was leading a rebellion against him. Well, I think Psalm 4, according to most Hebrew scholars and uh, Renaissance electricians, those two things are often the same, according to them, this psalm is really a uh, continuation of that same story. You know, in a movie sometimes, um, you know, the movie's going to take place at a certain setting, but there's something really important in the background. So sometimes they'll have a scene where somebody's just a little kid and you're following this little thing and something happens, and then suddenly the filmmaker superimposes words over the next scene because you need to know six years later, or 10 years later, and now that, that, that previous scene is really important, but now we're in a, a whole new kind of context, but you needed to know about that previous thing. That's what Psalm 4 is like. It, that rebellion uh, against David by his son Absalom has happened. He's survived it. God's come through. And now this is sometime later. So that, you know, that's, that's really important for us to know, to, to think about the fact that Solomon's, uh, Solomon Absalom's rebellion was a family feud. It was a family feud. It was, it was a, a form of a, of a civil war. Uh, it, was, it was pitted covenant member against covenant member or Israelite against Israelite. And in that, in that conflict that happened, David was delivered, right? God delivered him. That was something we looked at last week. God delivered David, his chosen anointed one, from that situation. But, but when you're the delivered one, now what's your attitude toward those that lost? Because if you've been delivered, 
then they were, by definition, defeated. But they're still family. They're still part of God's covenant people. So what are your attitudes like toward them? And what should your communication be like? How do you relate in that situation? So Psalm 4 is really about reconciliation. You might have heard the expression that you can uh, win the argument and still be wrong. You know, there's something about you know, being right in your position, and, and you, can, you can win that argument, but just by your demeanor or by your attitude toward the person or, or whatever it is, you still end up in the wrong. Well, Psalm 4 is a good one for us in that kind of area. And uh, so let's read this week's psalm, and then uh, we'll make some comments about it. Psalm 4. Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long will you people, now he's talking to people, how long will you people Turn my glory into shame. How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart his faithful servant for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Tremble and do not sin when you're in, on your beds. Search your hearts and be silent. Offer the sacrifices of the righteous and trust in the Lord. Many, Lord, now he's talking to God again, many, Lord, are asking, who will bring us prosperity? Let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy when their grain and new wine abound. In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Uh, A really important word for the background and understanding of this passage, and Uh, I could easily say any passage of the Bible is one I've already used this morning briefly, and that's the word covenant. Covenant. God loves them. I mean, they're everywhere in the Bible. They're they're such an important concept and an idea. And they already existed um, in ancient times before the most famous kind of first idea. It's not the it's not really the first idea of a covenant, but it's the place that really catches your attention, and that's this covenant that God makes with Abraham, the, the first Israelite, you could say. And uh, that's, that's a famous story of a uh, smoking pot, not the way we use the trend, the words this, in these days. Uh, if you take a look in Genesis chapter 15 and 16 sometimes, you'll see that there's this covenant made. A covenant is cut. And it's literally a covenant that's cut. I don't know if we have the expression cut a deal from that story of Abraham. I wouldn't be surprised if it goes back that far. And if you know a little bit of your ancient Bible stories, that story with Abraham is so crucial. And in that story, um, it, 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 it's God using a type of covenant that was already known in their day and age. That's what I mean by the idea that God loves covenants, but covenants were already around before God started using them to introduce himself, to um, reveal himself, to help people understand who he is and how this whole thing is working, God uses this common idea of a covenant. And this strange form of covenant in the ancient world was this idea where a number of animals were cut in half, placed on a path in two pieces, and the two people that are making a promise to one another, a covenant, would together walk between the dismembered animals that lay on the ground, and the basic message was, may the same thing fall upon our heads or happen to us if either of us break our agreement that we're making publicly in this covenant. Now, uh, I don't know if anybody's ever thought, you know, people are always looking for new ideas for a marriage ceremony. I haven't seen that one used where anybody dismembers some chickens, puts them on the aisle, and the husband and wife walk through. It's a very ancient form of covenant making. Most churches won't even allow you to throw confetti anymore, so I don't think dismembered animal bodies along the aisle are going to really work. You could maybe do it at an outdoor wedding. But it's a pretty somber thing. But the twist on that familiar way to enter into a binding covenant that was part of the culture of the day, was in that story, again, go back to Genesis 15 to 17, look at it later. In that situation, God gives Abraham the instructions. Abraham would have had every, every indication, okay, I know what's going to happen next. Um, God's telling me to get all this thing set up, and then God and I are going to walk down this path together, and we're going to enter into some kind of an agreement. But what happens is, is 
God causes Abraham to fall into this deep sleep. And uh, Abraham then, God reveals himself in this vision of this smoking pot or an oven or something like this that by itself passes through and consumes all of these sacrifices. Well, there's, what's the point of that? What's that twist? Well, it's like the guarantee that this covenant is going to last, that it's going to stand, God's saying, it's all me. It's all on me. In fact, Abraham, you were leaning against a tree sleeping. That's how involved you are in making sure that this covenant takes place. It's all in God's hands. And then Abraham is basically, what's his job in his story? What is he known to Abraham, the father of faith? He's to trust God in what God has done and promised. That's this covenant made with, that's the God that this author in Psalm 4 is talking about. So it's really important to, to understand that whole story and concept behind it. The one, the God that's being trusted in, in uh, verse 1, my righteous God, God is the definition of righteous. That's the foundational idea. Uh, and so as he's in this crisis, he thinks, you know what? In the end, no matter what's going on, this has got to end right for God's called ones. It's got to end up made right because God is the right, just God. Like he's, God is right. And God makes things right. So based on God's promises, no matter what's happening around me, I'm trusting, worshiping in my righteous God. So sometimes we can get discouraged and despair about unfairness and confusion, and there are those prayers for us to use at that time. But ultimately, foundationally, this prayer is a prayer to that righteous God. It's, verse 3 is really important um, in uh, the covenant connection. Uh, before I get there, I should jump and not just jump over verse 2. Many are saying of me, God, oh no, wrong hymn, wrong, wrong song. How long will people turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek fall gods? He's, he's concerned because people are turning away from this foundational truth that God will make this right. God will provide whatever we need. I got, I got batteries in this uh, wireless microphone, you know, that I'm using right now to power it up. And I, I, like to, I used to like to use the expression with my youth group back in the day that when God promises something or he gives us a gift or whatever, he provides, they come batteries included. God doesn't give us a gift or make a promise and not provide the power needed for that promise to happen. And, and that's just crucial to hold on to. So in, in this psalm, um, that's, that's the God that's being trusted. It's really important to, to hold on to this covenant connection. If you're going to color in the pictures here in this, in this poem, in this hymn, in this psalm, you really need to use the palettes that come with the idea of covenant in order to end up with the right picture. He, the person writing this psalm is in a relationship with that God. And, and verse 3 tells us that that God is responsive. That God, where do, we, where do we hear him? He says, give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me. Hear my prayer. He knows that this God responds. This is a righteous God, and it's a responsive God. He, he, it basically, the person that gets responded to then is moved to tremble and worship. If you look at these words, um, tremble and do not sin when you're on your bed. Search your heart and be silent. Um, trembling can be either with anger or in fear. And it's really hard in this passage to figure out which one of those words he means by tremble. It seems to be aimed at the people that had previously joined the majority that were in rebellion against God's plan and were trying to break away and trying to manage things on their own and trying to put their own king on the throne and make, make something happen here. And uh, that, those people are being spoken to here. And uh, in either case, either they're complicit in the assault on God's anointed or they just made the mistake but he's basically acknowledging here that they're still family. 
Because you notice he's still talking to them. You notice he's still talking to them. He's saying, this is what you've done in fear or in confusion or in despair, no matter what, make the sacrifices of the righteous. If you think about it for a minute, verses 4 and 5 are, are really ministry. They're reconciliation in New Testament terms. They're discipleship. Like I say, he's still talking to the ones that had left the path. They, they lost the battle, but they didn't lose their identity. And David still seems to be praying for their return to God's pleasure and light. Because verse 6 can be hard to kind of understand. Many, Lord, are asking, who will bring us prosperity? It's hard to figure out who's actually asking that question or who's saying it or or where that voice is coming from. Um, John Golden Gay is an Old Testament scholar. He makes a good case that the people of Israel have been watching the nations around them and even the rebels that gave up on the God who made that covenant and made those promises. And you know what? They seem, to be, they seem to have been prospering. So now the pressure's on them as God's covenant people to show that God can be depended on. So they're asking, who, who will bring us prosperity? You know what? When I read the word prosperity and you read the word prosperity, what do you think of? We usually think of things like Bentleys and like Rolex watches. Uh, Nico was informing me this morning, I, I understand Nico's full of awesome facts, that this is the largest house in the world. So, you know, that's what we think of when we think of Prosper. He also asked me at 9 o'clock, when's the show start? But anyhow, we think, when we read prosperity, that's what we think of. We think of all of this excess and everything. But, but the prosperity here is described as when the grain and, and new wine abound. What's that all about? Well, prosperity in an agricultural society like this, like they, they seem to be very obsessed with food and harvests and grain and uh, new wine in the Bible because they talk about that a lot. You know, um, Maybe that's where the church potluck comes from. I'm not sure. But they were very intensely connected with being able to produce enough food to stay alive. So the new wine, the harvest, that's their dependence upon God for next year's food. I mean, you could have the largest farm in your area. You could be using the best 6th century B.C. farming techniques and tools. You could have hand-plowed all of those fields. You could have planted that seed that you had just carefully um, collected and stored under the best conditions you could provide for it, thrown it into the ground. And you know what you can't do? You can't go over to the tap and turn on the irrigation system and water your 200 acres. I mean, already at that point, you were now hands off, and there's nothing more you could do but pray. Because it was all up to God. Whether you were going to prosper meant to have food next year. Meant to have, you know, and it was out of your hands. It was something that you couldn't control. So on one hand, you know, they had plenty of teaching on the futility of the false gods of the nations. But when the other's crops came in, the pressure was on God's people. Who will bring us prosperity? Who can we trust, on, trust in? He, he, he quotes from one of the most famous prayers from the book of Numbers. Probably one of the most famous prayers in all of Israel's history and church history and Christianity and, and the entire Bible. And it's from the book of Numbers, where Moses prays over the Israelites and says, the Lord bless you and keep you. Well, what does being kept mean? We, uh, does it mean just being kept in his, in his family? He's already gone on record uh, saying that, you know, this covenant I'm making with my people and, and it'll never be broken. Uh, well, we have the expression, she's a kept woman. I've had friends accuse me of being a, kept man. That John Blackman, he's got that hard-working nurse wife. He's a kept man. You know, it's this idea, right, of you're provided for when you're kept. So Moses said, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. That, that phrase is in our passage. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. This psalm is really a paraphrase of that famous prayer. This idea of your face shining, 
my my granddaughter Heidi, uh, the uh, the two ninths of the uh, crew that aren't here at our church. Heidi's now a little over two, and uh, she really reads faces. She really reads faces. Unfortunately, she's a very literalistic reader of faces. So she's at the age where she is watching your expression, and, uh, you know, she's a pretty tough kid, but you cannot make play faces with her. I'm always joking around with my grandkids. But with Heidi right now, you can't make the pretend angry face at her when something happens because as soon as you do, you just see her start sinking into her boots and the gerbil wheels, the gerbil's turning the wheels in her, and she'll just start crying. You, you can't put on the sad face with her and make her, uh, you know, break her. You, all the kind of things you do to try to cheer up a toddler or, or play with them, forget about it. She's just very literalistic. But that got me thinking when I read this. Make your face shine upon. Turn your face toward us. How do you read God's face? How do you know his face is shining on you? You know, pray for it. What's it going to look like when that prayer is answered? He says, let the light of your face shine on us. Remember, now he's praying not only for himself, but these ones that had rebelled against them. This is the reconciliation idea. God, bring your children back together. Make your face shine on us. He says, fill my heart with joy Then their, when their grain and wine new wine abound. Fill my heart with joy when their grain and new wine abound. Can you be happy for other people's good fortune? Can you pray for that? But back to this whole face shining thing, you know, how do you know? Is it that rain that I talked about that you had to depend on for God to be able to make your crops come? Or is it the rain that we depend on God not sending so we can meet outside for church on a Sunday morning? Is, is that what he's talking about? Is that how you know that God's face is shining on you? It, sort of. And that's why this is a prayer. And it's actually a prayer based on a prayer. Remember, Moses prayed that, God's blessing. Whatever this is, his face shining upon you, when it comes... It's going to be because God decided to send it. So whatever this blessing is, it's still in God's hands. There is something about prayer where we do have a bad habit of kind of getting in the mentality that prayer is our remote control. You know, that's probably caused more damage to families in in the last 50 years than anything. They won remote control for the television. (laughs) Now somebody's got the power. But we kind of think of that's what prayer is. I I got the remote now. I can make this life work better because now I got the remote. It's like, God, I really need a parking spot because I'm running out of time. Or God, there's too much month at the end of the money. Or God, I need you to do this. I need you to do that. And and prayer becomes like a remote control. Is, Is that what he's after here? Well, you got to remember who has the control. And it's God. And we do, we are encouraged to ask him for anything. Nothing is too small to ask. But the heart of faith leaves the things that only God can do in God's hands. It's that God that we pray to. Remember, God had made the promise, and Abraham's job was to take God at his word. So when we ask for God to make his face shine upon us, it's that God that we pray to. The one that's gone on record saying, He's entered into a covenant. So so the psalmist can say in verse 8, In peace I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. So having talked all of this idea of covenant and reconciliation that's going on in here, think about ourselves this morning around the Lord's table. Around the Lord's table. If you think that Abraham's story was something, how about the length that God would go to to give you the confidence in the dependability of the new covenant? Because this was just not a couple of goats and chickens that were torn in order for the solemnity of that covenant being made by God himself. This is his only begotten son. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him 
will not perish, but have everlasting life. But who does all the work? God, through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. All the ideas from our psalm can be found here at the Lord's table. Covenant reconciliation. Peace with God, knowing we can sleep at night because God, in peace I will lie down and sleep for you alone, Lord. Make me dwell in safety. Next time you have a sleepless night, I'd recommend, instead of counting sheep, go back to the last time that you participated in the Lord's Supper and remind yourself that God gave his one and only son that I could become a child of God, be in his family. Remember, God's the righteous God, so things will be made right because it's God's plan that triumphs. God, the righteous God. So we can have long Psalm 4 times of misunderstanding, and he started this prayer, give me relief from my distress, have mercy on me and hear my prayer. But we ultimately have this foundational idea that God can be counted on, that he's the guarantor of the blessings and the keeping of the terms of all of his work and our calling, faith in his finished work. That doesn't just make this a new covenant. This makes it the last covenant. It always blows me away when I think, and, and we really should, you know, always kind of have a picture of the upper room. The first time Jesus met around the table with his disciples and broke bread, and we were reminded of those words every time we do communion. But that was on the night he was betrayed. Those words always catch me when I read them. I'll, I'll read them again this morning in, in Corinthians. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and broke it fully conscious of what was about to happen. Jesus, in advance, again, the disciples don't even know, they don't even seem to have a grasp of what's about to happen and what's about to go down because it just seems to catch them by shock. So you can't really give them much credit for their part in securing this new covenant. I mean, the first time they took communion, to use that term, they didn't even know what was going on yet. And here's Jesus laying down in advance. This is about to happen. You're to do this regularly and remember what I've done. That I've made this covenant with you. That you will be able to rest in safety knowing that I've done this. It should move us to worship. Jesus was the sacrifice of the righteous. We're told in this psalm, you know, what are we to do? We're to repent and make the sacrifice of the righteous. But we, we, we repent when we stop thinking we can be righteous or make it right on our own, and we realize our need, and we accept Christ as the righteous sacrifice. We, we join this morning to identify our hope with that sacrifice. It's the new covenant. It's that God making this arrangement with us. Let me pray together, and then we will uh, meet around the Lord's table. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there's so many ways that you answered Psalm 4 in a final way. Because all creation was crying out to you in distress. And you answered by your Son being made man. Fully God and fully man. And he lived this perfect and righteous life that we could never live on our own. He lived sinless in a broken, sinful world that we have to take responsibility for in in our sin. And yet he lived this perfect, righteous life. And in his grace and in his love and in his passion for your calling on his life, he was willing, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Because of his obedience, you validated his sacrifice and raised him from the dead and seated him at your right hand. We've already worshipped him as King and King and Lord of Lords today, but this morning we are going to meet around your table and uh, we want to be reminded that this is the new 
and final covenant, our hope in Jesus Christ, that the work of salvation was done by him and we identify with it as your children by faith. And you count that as righteousness. And we thank you for your good plan and our good Savior who enables us to lie in safety. In his name we pray, amen.